to The Cup, where we will be spilling all sorts of tea about what's going on inside Washington, D.C., what regulators and lawmakers are thinking and working on, and what you and your credit union should be focused on in terms of risk areas and areas of opportunity. I'm your host, Ann Petros, and also Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at NAFQ. And today I am joined by NAFQ's President and CEO, Dan Berger. Dan is a titan in the credit union industry and super knowledgeable about all of the policy issues facing your institution. So I am very excited to have the opportunity to chat with you today, Dan. Thank I'm you. I'm generally excited to be here. So thanks for the, for the invitation. Really Absolutely. All right, let's get started. So recently, there's been a lot of uh, turmoil in the banking industry, um, you know, following the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Can you explain, you know, first how credit unions are different? And, you know, what in terms of the like business account and deposit insurance, you know, perspective makes credit unions unique? Yeah, it's it's night and day. What what went on at SVB Bank was a complete failure on multiple levels, including mm. management, risk management. Uh the Federal Reserve saw red flags, they just didn't mitigate or or take action. So when you quadruple your uninsured assets um, in three to four years, that's a problem. And so yeah. when they got shut down, 97% of their assets were uninsured. That's Ab- wild. Absolutely I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. And so you saw, you're looking at, and when you look at the credit, you've got 50% of banks or uninsured assets where 90 to 91% of credit union assets are insured by mm-hmm. the NCOA share insurance fund. So the differentiation and the conservative nature of how credit unions are run completely night and day. Uh, I, I could not foresee credit unions be in the same kind of uh, instance and in, in, in trouble that SVP got, got mm-hmm. into. Mm-hmm. And I want to say that like on the whole, you know, community banks, I mean, we're not talking about like the giant institutions, but um, community banks tend to do a lot more of this like business Mm -hmm. accounts work, right? Yeah, Yeah. they have a lot more commercial accounts, but even with community banks, if you uh, strip out the large regional banks and the large uh, top four, the big Wall Mm -hmm. Street Mm -hmm. banks, 60 to 65% of their assets are uninsured. And so they have a similar problem if they're not careful from an interest rate risk uh, standpoint, liquidity standpoint. And so they have to watch their P's and Q's and make sure they're taking care of uh, of their portfolios as well and then their long-term investments. So, I mean, there, there can be problematic pretty quickly for them as well. Yeah. Obviously, things can shift pretty quickly. Like overnight. <laughs> right. Like literally overnight. Yeah. You know? So what do you think are the chances of Congress passing um, some sort of reform to deposit insurance requirements this year? I think we don't commend Congress very often, but I think mm. they need to be commended because they're doing a deep dive to figure out what exactly happened and then yeah. trying to get as much information. And of course, the Federal Reserve's doing the same thing. Let's find out what exactly occurred because in what was it? They were cited in 19, 2020, 2021. There were red flags, you know, at, at Signature as well as SVB. Why didn't they mitigate? Why, why didn't they come and do something about it and follow up with that kind of stuff? So then deep diving, I'm hoping that they find out what exactly happened before they start trying to promulgate new rules or, or start, you know, trying to pass some bills to deal with this one instance. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I don't think, I, I think there's a lot of headwinds for an actual piece of legislation passing. I think they're, they're, they're slow rolling it now. And every day that we get by a, a crisis and there's not a bank failure, I, I think the, the the financial markets are, mm-hmm. are kind of calmed down a little bit. Uh, that could change again overnight if there's another uh, major failure in, in the banking industry, um, but we don't see that on the horizon at this time. Okay. Yeah. So um, they're, they're just still in the uh, information gathering stages, let's call it. Yeah, which is good. So you don't have that knee jerk reaction. You don't have that spike in regulation or that spike in legislation that you often mm-hmm. see immediately after a crisis. They're gathering that information. And, and I, I think they're at this point doing a pretty good job at that. Mm-hmm. And in terms of, you know, the political breakdown of, you know, d- d- Democrats and Republicans, like where does each party stand on this issue? Is it divisive? Yeah, it, it, it's they've come together on it uh, mm-hmm. from the, uh, uh, for the most part. They all want to do something and really find out what happened. Both the Republicans and Democrats want more information. What exactly occurred? 
what did the management team miss at SVP? They didn't have a risk mm -hmm. officer, for goodness sakes, for a large, yeah. you know, institution over $200 billion. Come on, you need a you know, That's an enterprise. Yeah. Oh, absolutely concerning. Mm -hmm. and, in, and again, we mentioned it earlier, when you quadruple your uninsured assets, why didn't they mitigate some of those instances and come in? Those mm -hmm. red flags were there. And so to get that information, um, both sides are concerned about how it happened and, and try to find ways to make sure it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that piece is particularly shocking that, you know, not having a risk management strategy, a chief risk officer. I mean, we talked to credit unions that are getting close to the 10 billion threshold and, you know, will be subject to CFPB supervision about how important it is to have a chief risk officer. It, so, it, it, it's so incredibly important, um, especially with all the lines of business and, and their concentration risks that mm -hmm. they had. And you, you see it across the board, the interest rate, rising interest rates that we've dealt with, uh, the in interest rate risk that they're dealing with. With, and then they have that concentration risk and uninsured assets mm -hmm. like that and not have a risk person over it, a risk uh, officer over all that is pretty astonishing to everybody, I think. Right, right. Um, so, you know, looking at all of the deep dive, you know, as you call it, that's going into this issue. I mean, do you think that there's going to be some sort of spillover into the credit union industry? Should credit unions be concerned about tougher regulation? Because there's been some talk about, um, you know, targeting yep. these um, types of banks, you know, between one and 250 billion in assets to, you know, undo some of what's been categorized as, as, you know, a loosening of regulations in the past few years. Well, I'll, I'll boast about you. You and your team do a great job. You're vigilant on this. And mm -hmm. I and we are concerned about mission creep and spillover into the NCUA's realm of things in the credit union industry. But you've done a great job and your team done a great job making sure that doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. But we have to be vigilant. And yeah, does it keep me up at night? That's one of those things that keep keeps us up. That's how Dodd-Frank happened. Right. If we thought about it, the, the big banks got in the trouble, then it spilled over to the credit unions and other community mm -hmm. financial institutions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's something that we're keeping an eye on from a regulatory standpoint as well as a legislative standpoint. Yeah, yeah, definitely got to continue the conversation <laughs> with the NCUA. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> um, so let's kind of change topics and um, talk about digital assets, which, you know, actually sort of related to some of the, the bank failures, at least Signature Bank. Um, House Financial Services Chairman uh, McHenry is working on legislation related to digital assets, just generally, including stable coins. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think might be in, you know, what, what do you think should be included in these bills? Well, you know, Brad Thaler and his legislative team, we're, we're focused on parity. We just want to make mm -hmm. sure that we're on the same level playing field as banks and other non-depository institutions that are dealing with digital assets. We want, if credit unions decide from a business model standpoint, a strategic standpoint, they also want to be in this marketplace, they have that right to do that. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to have the bankers be the only ones who can do it. So we're focused uh, very aggressively to make sure there's, there's any m legislation moving that there's parity there. And it's the same thing. We're also being uh, very watchful of their concern, any spillover from what they're dealing with with the FDIC affects the NCOA. And so we're keeping a real close eye on anything mm -hmm. like that. But we're looking for parity. So if you're in giving more powers to banks and other uh, financial institutions, we want credit unions to have it. But we also, if you're going to give any new powers and authorities to the FDIC, we want to make sure our prudential regulators on the credit union side also have the same powers mm -hmm. and authorities. Mm -hmm. It seems that after the fallout from FTX, there's been sort of a shift in in thinking, I guess, a more conservative way of, you know, viewing digital assets and, um, you know, potentially getting involved through custodying and, and issuing um, these sorts of assets. And, you know, it seems like a lot of credit unions see the value in the underlying technology, the blockchain technology mm -hmm. or distributed ledger technology, but are hesitant to, you know, dip their toes in into this. And I mean, the NCUA has also been pretty silent um, the past few months. So, you know, any, any thoughts on, I guess, what credit unions should be thinking about the next steps in terms of digital assets. I mean, the banking regulators have been a little um, 
I guess conservative is the right way to put it too. And saying that, you know, maybe there's, um, there are greater risks in dealing with these digital assets than we previously thought. Yeah. And and it's one of those things where it's your job and my job to Mm -hmm. make sure we have as many tools in the toolbox as possible, new powers and authorities so credit unions can grow. I mean, that's our mission. That's what we're, 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 what we do here at NAFQ. And so we want to get as many tools in the toolbox as possible. Then it's up to the credit union and the CEO and the management team and, and their board of directors. Is this what we want to get into? Does it fit our strategy in the next five, 10 That's years? Right. Does it fit our business model, our business plan? But it's our job. It's not our job to tell them what to mm-hmm. do or which one to do or not do. We have credit unions that are members that don't do member business lending. But that's one of the tools that's in the toolbox that mm-hmm. we help uh, put there. We want to make sure digital assets is something they want to do. They have that ability to do it if they make a strategic decision to do so. Mm -hmm. We're not saying it's good or bad. I mean, there's a lot of red flags around crypto and and digital assets, and and I get it. Um, But if you, uh, at the time, the height of all the digital assets, credit unions were experiencing immense outflows. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew one credit union had $2 million going to the Robin Hoods and the Coinbases of the world. If I'm a CEO of a credit union, I want to build a moat around my institution. I don't want that money to leave and go to another platform because, you know, the other platforms are offering credit cards. You know, they're going to start offering uh, personal loans and other uh, lending products. So I want to build a moat. I'm not saying hold digital assets on the books or anything, but custodial services and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I keep people at my institution. Mm -hmm. Those outflows are going to happen anyway. So why would I give that, that fee income? in in that member engagement and that member experience to another platform that's out there. I'd like to kind of build a moat around my institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. So what I'm hearing is parity and access, or at least, you know, the opportunity, the option to engage. That's correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. What are the biggest legislative risks right now from your perspective? For, from our, from NAFQ's perspective, my perspective, I, I think uh, for the most part, it's the attack on non-interest income. Mm. Whether it's interchange, it's uh, courtesy pay or overdraft, things along those lines. Uh, interchange, interchange is one of those things that really keeps me up at night. Durbin is one of the smartest members of Congress. Uh, he knows the process extremely well. And he's relentless. He, he's <laughs> relentless. Uh, he's extremely smart. Um, and, and so that's already out there. His Credit Card Competition Act, which is a misnomer by uh, any stretch, he's out there. He'll, he's going to file it again, likely this spring. So that, that interchange income that all financial institutions need is under threat. And so we're going to continue to push back and, and fight against that. That's the, that's a big one. And then again, parity across all areas that we see from a legislative perspective, mm-hmm. but interchange, that's one of those things. That's a, big one. That's a, that's a huge one, especially mm-hmm. in this, you know, low margin environment that we've been operating in for the last couple of decades, very difficult for uh, credit unions to make right. money. So you lose an, a, a non-interest income source like interchange, it becomes problematic pretty quickly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And obviously, there's a you know regulatory side of things with the CFPB looking at at fees and um, you know imposing some limitations there. So it, it makes it challenging uh, on the whole. But um, you know, how has NAFQ been working with Congress to advance you know the credit union industry? I mean, what have Brad and his team been up to? Yeah, Brad and his team and, and Greg Misak do a great job. They're on the Hill just about every day. Mm-hmm. They're in contact every day with uh, members of Congress and, and their staff. And so it's that ongoing engagement uh, with the policymakers uh, on Capitol Hill. And uh, you have to do it all the time. And you have to be vigilant all the time. And we have a lot of new members of Congress that have to be educated, not just on credit unions, but issues that affect the financial services marketplace. So it's a nonstop education process that we have to be part of. But they're in contact every single single day with Capitol Hill. And you have to, you, you have to be on uh, Capitol Hill. You have to be in constant contact to make sure that your story is being told. And mm-hmm. Brad and his team and Greg and everybody has done a wonderful job doing that. Yeah. And obviously there is also always an opportunity for grassroots, um, you know, activism and, right. and speaking directly to your members of Congress to share your story. Those are pretty impactful, right? Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and if you, our grassroots page, which is on our website, it's really powerful. And, and to get involved and have your voice told and your story told, mm-hmm. we have wonderful legislative and regulatory lobbyists at NAFQ. 
absolutely the best in all of financial services. But when you really want to really sway and put your thumb on the scale when issues arise, stories from back home in, in that member of Congress's district matter. Mm -hmm. That's how you can tilt the, 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 um, the scales in, in our direction. And that grassroots uh, component is absolutely crucial. So when NAFQ or anybody else reaches out and say, hey, Durbin's filed this bill, get involved, you know, call your member of Congress, oppose it. And it's one of those things, you have a call to action that we send out. We don't do it very often. So when we have a call to action, you have to do it. Get involved, get your board involved, get your mm -hmm. staff involved. Uh, in some instances, get your members involved because this is going to affect your bottom line. And as we pick issues that we work on here at NAFQ, as you know better than anybody, it's operational. Those are the issues we focus on. And so these issues that affect your non-interest income, you have to get involved and, and protect your bottom line. And that's what that grassroots uh, involvement does and, mm -hmm. and provides uh, for the entire industry. Absolutely. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, CFPB has been looking at fees, including uh, credit card late fees. They've also been busy uh, with other rules recently finalizing the Section 1071 Small Business <laughs> Data Collection. Did you see my rule. eye roll? I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a bit of uncertainty surrounding the Bureau uh, because of the case that will be heard before the Supreme Court this fall um, on their funding structure. So, should the CFPB be reformed and what do you think is the best outcome of this case? I would say be dissolved, but that's not going <laughs> to, that's, that's not going to occur as much as I, I get phone calls from credit and CEOs. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it going to go away? And, uh, very clearly the CFPB is never going to go away. Yeah. How they're funded may change and, and be maybe part of their preparations process. We'll see how that, uh, that outcome occurs. But I think at a minimal, there needs to be a commission or a board that oversees it, like the NCOA right. or FDIC. Bipartisan. I think, yeah, have a bipartisan commission that oversees this very powerful regulator and that you, didn't, you don't have just one czar that's in charge of it, no matter who's in the White House or who's in the Oval Office. I, I think a, a bipartisan commission would be extremely helpful at a minimum with mm -hmm. the CFPB. Yeah. I mean, that just is likely to lead to better policy, right? You've got more perspectives. You would think. It, it, what's interesting, it, it, it was in the original bill during the whole Dodd-Frank debate in 2009-2010, Barney Frank's version uh, on the House side had a commission. Mm -hmm. And then the Senate uh, took it out and made it a, a director position and stuff. So mm -hmm. th there's a precedent from a discussion and debate standpoint. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we can get get there. I think there's some bipartisan support with a commission or board uh, for the CFPB. Right. If we could go back in time. Oh, <laughs> there's it. a lot of I things. I wonder how things look There's a lot of things days. that I would do if I go back in time. Yeah. <laughs> I'd give you a whole list. <laughs> so looking ahead to the rest of the year, what do you think will be the biggest challenge for credit unions or challenges? And um, how is NAFQ here to support our members? Well, I think the biggest challenges are going to be some of the economic headwinds. Mm -hmm. you're, you're beginning to see spikes in, in credit card debt. You're beginning to see delinquencies in, in used autos. I think those are some of the headwinds. But of course, you know, the interest rate environment is, is problematic. Uh, liquidity is still going to be a challenge uh, throughout our industry. And so keeping an eye on, on some of that. The interest rate uh, risk management is going to be mm -hmm. extremely important to, to, to keep an eye on. But there's also opportunities out there. I mean, as much if there's a recession, whether it's a hard landing or a soft landing, that's up for debate. But credit unions were built for this moment. Okay, as not-for-profit financial institutions, we successfully weathered every storm that we've ever faced. You know, and, and you see all the failures in the banking side. No matter what failures, what moment in time where those failures occurred, credit unions still came out much better and much stronger. We're built for this moment. And so now's the opportunity to help your members and prepare your members for these headwinds that are coming. And there's a lot of opportunity out there for credit unions. Mm -hmm. All right. I love the positive outlook. <laughs> um, you know, when you're talking to policymakers, members of Congress, um, you know, regulators, anyone in the in the administration, how do you tell them about the credit union difference and why, you know, this nation needs a strong credit union industry? I mean, I think that's especially important right now, considering yep. some of the the uh, chaos. No, you're exactly said. right. And then the credit union difference is being not for profit 
cooperatives, mm -hmm. it matters. We don't have those financial quarterly pressures that the banks may have uh, with a 24-year-old analyst on Wall Street asking questions and you worry about your stock price and all that kind right. of stuff going on. We don't have that type of pressure. So you can really take care of your members. You can have a long-term view of some of the things that you want to accomplish for your institution and for your community. But one of those things that you have to really look at um, from that standpoint is think back when credit union started. It started because of the robber barons. They're out there. You don't want three or four big banks controlling the entire financial services marketplace. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason there's 135 million American consumers that utilize a credit union today. That's huge. You want to have you want them to have that choice in, 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 in that marketplace. You want that competition so you get better rates and, and, and you're taken care of and you get better service. You don't want to go back to those three or four big uh, financial institutions controlling the entire financial services marketplace. It just, it just rolled back in time and it, and it would really harm communities. It would harm individuals and consumers. You have to have credit unions to keep people in check. Mm -hmm. That community focus and, you know, as Dr. Chopra likes to point out, relationship banking um, is is really key and, and makes a difference in a lot of communities. And I mean, I personally think obviously consumers should be looking for that type of institution for their financial services needs. Completely agree. And, and you're seeing community banks and the big banks leave communities, mm -hmm. whether it's in inner cities, whether it's in rural areas, creating uh, financial deserts. Credit unions want to step in and provide mm -hmm. banking services in, in those areas. So to have credit unions have to be there because they keep the member, they keep that customer, they keep that community top of mind. Mm -hmm. That's important where you see them closing branches in, in a, a farming community, that destroys a community. Right. You, you need to have access to capital to survive and the, in banking services to survive. And so you, you're beginning to see credit unions, credit unions open more branches than the banks closed. And so real powerful message there for our policymakers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you are coming up on your 10 year anniversary <laughs> as CEO of NAFQ this July. Make me feel old, man. <laughs> No, congratulations. That's a, that's a huge accomplishment. Um, what do you view as the most important methods to engage with our credit union members to gather feedback on you know, policy and political questions? That's a great question. And, and there's a multitude of ways to do it. I, I think talking one-on-one -on -one with the members is extremely helpful. I use the anecdotes and stories that I'm told by CEOs or lending officers or frontline personnel uh, at credit unions. I use those stories. Likewise, and, yeah, and talk and, to the regulators. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and talk to the regulators, talk to policymakers on, on Capitol Hill. Those stories matter. Talking about that single mom getting a loan so that she can get her car fixed so mm -hmm. she can go to work or take her kids to school. Whatever it is, there's stories out there and they're impactful. And those stories have to continue to be told. But you mentioned earlier, our grassroots, there's ways to get involved. Our grassroots page uh, on our NAFQ website, very powerful. That's a, one way to, to get involved and, and, and give us feedback. Uh, we do surveys, as you know. I mean, Kurt Long does a, a great economic survey on various issues. That feedback gets you know formulated and packaged and sent to regulators, sent to members of Congress on Capitol Hill, White House, Treasury. So the, those surveys are also in, impactful. But also the NAFQ networks, mm -hmm. absolutely huge. I mean, we have almost a dozen of them now, and, and they're very impactful to get involved in, in exchange information with myself and, and you and the rest of NAFQ staff. But then we have our uh, committees. We have the NAFQ committees, the Reg Affairs Committee that you oversee, and the Legislative Affairs Committee, or the Share Insurance. We have a half dozen of those. And so those committees is another terrific way to get feedback and we focus on operational issues. You and I don't pick these issues. Mm -hmm. that these issues that we work on come from the bottom up, from our members and talking to us about them. And then we vet them through the committee structure. Mm -hmm. And then the board of directors, the NAFQ board of directors, who do a great job, they sit there and they vet that and they talk about it. How is this you know, rule that's about to be promulgated going to affect NAFQ members mm -hmm. or, or the CEO, or he or she running that institution and, and their teams? Or how is this bill going to affect this institution, they see it through the eyes of the CEO in that institution, and that's how decisions are made. So being involved in that committee structure and that network structure is a wonderful way to, mm -hmm. to give feedback to, to your, you and to me and everybody else here at NAFQ. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And especially for, you know, those who are subject matter experts, you know, we decided to set up some working groups, you know, one on housing finance, yep. uh, one on digital assets, on small business lending. I know Brad's team um, just recently set up a, a group on CDFIs. Yep. And so you have plenty of opportunities to to share your specific knowledge and and um, expertise so that we're more informed um, when we go and speak to the regulators and lawmakers absolutely all, every all those channels that you just mentioned are extremely important and there's a multiple of opportunities if there's something that's a that's affecting your institution if there's a problem that we can help you solve let us know and then we'll start working on it from that from the you know ground up and so those operational issues that's impactful those non-interest uh, income point uh, pain points that we deal with let us know what they are and we'll work on it and those are the kinds of things you and i just don't come up with this stuff i mean it's operational right. issues that they hey we have a problem with the cdfi right. process at, at treasury there's a backlog you immediately went to work you and your team immediately went to work to, to deal with that issue there's i can tell stories of all the work that you and your team have done just like that because someone brought that pain point to your attention right. And so the, that that feedback matters. And that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. People join for the advocacy and stuff. We, yeah, we provide comp uh, compliance assistance and education and training. But 99.9% .9 of the people that join NAFQ is for your work and Brad Thaler's work and Greg Misak and the lobbying that we do as a team. Mm -hmm. that, that's the advocacy's job one here. And so but those issues, that's how we, de we determine them. As you know, better than I do, they contact you. Hey, I got this problem at the NCOA. Or have this problem with mm -hmm. the CFPB, and they they'll give you the granular aspects of that problem, and then you can go to work and try to solve it for them. Mm -hmm. And so you and your team do a great job with it. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, we want to hear from you. So <laughs> <laughs> um, no issue is too small. Uh, it's all important, and you know we have an opportunity to make a difference to uh, you know convince the regulators that they should be updating their regulations, or you know share your stories with Congress. And yep. I mean that may be a longer process, but sometimes the rulemaking process takes a while too. Um, so you know either way, that's what we're here to do, and and. We love doing it. So, Absolutely. You know, one step at a time, but we need your ideas. <laughs> and we do. Yeah. Tell us what your problem is. Tell us your pain points. We'll yeah. get to work. All right. Any other closing comments for our viewers and listeners? I, I think you said it. I'll just uh, reiterate what you said. Contact us. Let mm -hmm. us know what your pain points are. Let us know how we can help you. We work for you. You know, we work for the member and then that's who happened. We take that very seriously, as you know, and then said, let us know how we can be of help. And that's what we're here for. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you for tuning in to this discussion on credit union policy issues. If you enjoy watching The Cup or listening to The Cup, please hit subscribe, hit the like button, uh, set your alerts so you get notifications of new episodes and leave us a review. Tell us what you'd like to hear about or learn about next time. We'd love to hear your ideas. And until next time.